Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to MPUC's Ubin Day 2021 webinar. My name is Kaming, and I'm from the Pulau Ubin branch at the National Parks Board. Pesla Ubin is the annual iconic celebration of the nature, culture, and heritage of Pulau Ubin, and is led by the community. Activities that showcase the wondrous nature or relieve the old tales of the Emerald Island are abound. Through these activities, we hope to pique the interest of people with regards to Ubin, as well as to learn something about the island. Due to the COVID-19 situation, most of the activities are still on virtual platform so that everyone could enjoy the celebration safely. Today is Ubin Day, which is the culmination of the long celebration that started since 28th of August. In support of this day, NPARCS is hosting this Ubin Day webinar. Here are the two talks we have for today. If you haven't signed up for the next talk, you may still join us at the meeting link shared on the chat. You may also watch them on our YouTube channel, MPUX SG, at your convenience. Pulau Ubin is one of the key biodiversity areas in Singapore and is a sanctuary to wildlife. Despite being just a small island, we have over 250 species of birds and a variety of habitats that support different ecological niches. Ubin is also an important stopover for migrant birds, such as the shorebirds. For example, we have our very first official record of little stint for Singapore, which was recorded in Chick Jawa in 2017. Our speaker for today, David Lee, is our in-house expert for shorebirds in NParks. He is the conservation manager of Sungai Buloh Wetland Reserve and is also the lead author for a five-year study which satellite tracking of shorebirds was utilized to highlight the importance of local wetland habitats for these shorebirds. For those on Zoom, if you have any questions during the talk, please send them to co-host Tio Kaming as a private message using the chat. We will try to address a few of them later on. Without further ado, let me welcome David to bring us on this fascinating journey alongside with the Shorebirds. David, please. Thanks, Kaming, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to the shower lovers in Singapore about the shower of Plaubin. Before we start the talk, we would like to run a quiz to see how many of you are already uh, very good at in the knowledge of shower. So coming, would you mind to help to choose on the quiz on the screen? Thank you. Okay. For the benefits of our YouTube audience, I'll read the three questions. For each question, please select the answer which you think is correct. The first question, what are the characteristics of shorebirds? Is it A, birds that normally feed along the coast? Or B, most of them undertake long distance migration? Or C, they often flock together? Or D, all of the above. For second question, which shorebird in the least is the most common in Ubin? Is it A, common red shank? B, little stint? C, gray plover? Or D, oriental plover? For the final question, What's the maximum distance a shorebird can fly non-stop during migration? Is it A, 3,000 kilometers? Or is it B, 
5,000 kilometers? Or is it C, 8,000 kilometers? Or is it D, 12,000 kilometers? We'll just give everyone a bit more time to submit your answers before David reviews the results. Okay, we'll end the poll now. So here are the results of the poll. Okay, thanks a lot for everyone who sharing the result, which is really great. I can see most of the people have made a very good uh, contribution for the first question. Wow, what are the characteristics of a uh, shorebird? Which basically, why the bird is called a shorebird? Because actually, it's like to use the coast. And wow, they actually many of them can fly a very long distance, and then they like to flock together as well. So basically it's all of the above. Well, for the second question, what's a shorebird in the list is more common in Ubin? Well, this is an interesting and tricky question. And uh, you will be surprised actually, green flower is more common than a common racing. Why is that? Because actually shorebird like different habitat. The green flower actually prefers sandy beach, while the common resin prefers mudflat. So that's why for flow wind, it's not common for common resin, but actually green flower is much more common. And for the last question, what's the maximum distance a shower can fly non stop? Means they don't sleep, don't eat, they fly all day long, day and night, and they can fly 12,000 kilometer without a stop in about 10, 11 days. Can you believe that? So it's just such an amazing migration wonders of this migratory shorebird. So I would like to bring you the journey to learn more about them. Okay, so uh, you have quite a lot of them and uh, quite a lot of you has made the correct answers. I will not go through much details. I want to just share the shorebirds. They like to wading in the water. Sometimes that's why it's called the weeders, yeah? So therefore they are not good at in swim and they found mostly in the coast. That's why they call shorebird. Yeah, but they can also find in an inland mudflat. So it's not necessarily they all be found in the coast. And also they like to flock together so they can feel safe, but there's always some species like to do lonely. So like the common sandpiper, you will be always find one bird flying here and there. And many of the shorebirds can migrate and they do amazing journey, like what we mentioned earlier. They breed in the north, China, Russia, Alaska, and also they will travel down to avoid the winter. So birds are amazing in migration, but they need an all year long food supply. If there's not food, so they cannot success. And also they need suitable place for nest, stopover and non-breeding areas to ensure this success migration. Well, it's about 26% of the world's birds that undertake migration. It's about 2,000 species, yeah? So in the whole world, there are 10,000 species about and 20 of them migrate. 
And of this number of birds migrate, there are about 115 migratory shorebirds. So shorebirds normally make long distance journeys. Some of these birds can be small as 15 gram, make a year trip of more than 20,000 kilometers. I would like to share you of this amazing story of the Batu Godwit, which actually been cell attacked in 2017, uh, 2007, sorry for that. Well, at that time, cell tracking technology has been just used for this migratory species. So a scientist, a group of scientists able to track birds from New Zealand all the way to the Yellow Sea in China. And the bird has stopped in the Yellow Sea for about a month's time to refuel, continue the journey to Alaska. And from Alaska, the bird has took time to breed for about 80 over days. After journey, the bird managed to travel back to New Zealand. So, the flyway of shorebirds have about nine flyways worldwide. These include flyways all the way from East Asian to Australian flyway. So the flyways we are shooting at, it is called this East Asian Australasian flyway. And amongst the many other flyways. This East Asian Australasian flyway encompasses 22 countries, all the way from Alaska to New Zealand. And there are over 50 million of migratory water birds of 250 species are using the flyway. And this includes 8 million of shorebird of 54 species. Singapore is in the middle of flyway and it's very important for many birds that stop and using this place. And where you can find them, these are including places like Sungai Bulu Wetland Reserve, Mandai Mangrove and Ma Flat, Kati Bengshu and the Yishun Dam, Chek Jawa Wetland at Plau Bin, and Plau Degong, as well as Plau Samako. Although these last two places was not easy to assess. There are 266 species of birds has been recorded at Plowbin, which is about 64% of the total 414 species recorded in Singapore. And this includes 30 migratory shorebirds of uh, this total species. And you can see that east end of Plowbin, which is a Czech Java wetland, has provided a wonderful home for this migratory shorebird. I would like to share with you some of the common shorebird species of Plowbin. So this include the lesser sunflower. Well, plowbin can record about thousand of them, and the Pacific Garden flower, 
and gray flower. And these are the flower groups, which likes uh, sun peach in general. And then you also have this red neck stint, windrows, and common sandpipers. They can be found in flower bean as well. Now I would like to share with you some of the less common shorebird or plover bean, which include the bartle godwit. We shared early. This species is one of the amazing migrants. And then the species that looks like bartle godwit, but have a black tail, so it's called black tail godwit. And a taric sandpiper, which is a very small, cute bird a bird that has tracked quite a few people come to Songhai Bulu, which has a flag called B5, become quite famous recently. And a bird has been returning to Singapore every year. So green sandflower, Kaleo sandpiper, and broad bio sandpiper are some other birds that can be found at Czech Java Wetland. I would like now to share with you some of the rare shorebird that can be found at plow bin. This include what Gaming mentioned earlier, the little stint, and the ruddy tenstone, which is quite rare now in Singapore. Great knot, it's a globally endangered species due to the rapid decline. And the oriental plover, which is extremely rare these days. So we'll move on to share with you how to identify this shorebird. And the shorebird normally far away. It's very dark, gray, brown, which very uncolorful, so it's very hard to identify them. But there's always some tips we want to share with you. So if you were to visit a wetland, it's very important that you count in the right time, which is from September to March, because the birds come in in end of July to August, therefore they will reach in good number from September to March. And low tide is the most suitable time to watch birds in Czech Java and good to be at low tide at below 0 0.6 meter. Do check out the tide table before your visit. And you can use the Changi tide table as a reference. And other than that, it's very important to use the right equipment for this shorebird identification because normally they are very far. So therefore you need a binocular and scope. So, Binocular is quite necessary, while scope is good to have because it can room in a much detail. So while you do need a few guys trying to watch the bird and identify them, and you can use your digital device trying to Identify them. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, if you are visiting the wetland, then you're going to do a survey. It's very important that you get the information correct and you would be good to record all the detailed information, such as location, date, time, habitat, tide condition, weather condition, and who are the observers, and species and numbers seen in the field, as well as the behavior of the bird, and if possible, the sex and age of the bird. 
So how you study the bird? It's very important that you have some tips because there are many of them are sitting together. And what you can do is choose one of the bird, trying to look at them. And spend some time and write some notes how the bird looks like. And if possible, do a drawing. And what you can see on the screen is a bottled gold weight that is quite colorful, which because it's in a breeding plumage. So if you see a bird that just returned, you may see this kind of plumage. You may describe the bird has a very long bill and a reddish head and reddish chest and have some black barring on the back and brownish feathers and leg is black and so on. And by doing that, you will pick up the learning skill gradually to identify the short bird. So basically you look for what's the body side of the bird, what's the color and the patterns, how the bill looks like and how the length of the bill and the feeding movement behavior and how they fly and do they flock together and is that freshwater wetland, coastal wetland, a habitat? And when is the time the bird has come back? Is that just after migration or it has been here for a few months? And what call of the bird, of course, it's very important as well. So birds are in different sites. They either from small to large. You can see that the lesser sunflower is much smaller as compared to others, such as Pacific golden flower, green sand, and worm bros. And birds have different view shape, view lens. What you can see on the two birds on the left, they are flowers. Normally they have a large eye and short view. Or the bird on the right has a much longer view and curve down. So they can be separated by some of the good tips. If you are really interested in the migratory short bird, and there's upcoming programs that talk about bird ID, show bird ID, and how to count them even in a field in great details. The upcoming activity will be on the 9th of October during the World Migratory Bird Day. Do look for um, MPACS and Sumer Blue Wellhand Reserve website for this update. Well, I shared quite a bit on how to identify bird. I want to share you a bit more on how to monitor uh, what impacts program in study of them. So since 2017, impacts have been carried out shower sensors and rings at Czech Java wetland. And for bird ring session, we have used metal rings with individual numbers as I serve as IC for each individual bird. And the engraved color flags, means we have color flags with numbers on it. And these colors will be all green over white. And the flag is put on the left tibia of the bird. Left tibia basically is the left upper legs. So means that bird has been flagged at the floor within Czech Java Island. So if you see bird that flagged on the right tibia, that will be bird that from Sungai Bulu. Other than normal bird ringing, we have carried out satellite tracking activity for this migratory shorebird. We use solar power satellite transmitters at five gram and 9.5 gram. And we studied five species of shorebird from both Sungai Blue Wetland Reserve and Czech Java Wetland. 
I would like to share with you some of the findings of our study. So for Wimbro, we studied five adult birds and we found out they have been all bred in high latitude in Russia. But interestingly, they have taken two pathways to the breeding ground. Traditionally, we know birds has used the gestation or fishing flyway through the Yellow Sea. And indeed, four of the five birds has taken this flyway path all the way to breed in Siberia and Russia Far East, which is on the east of this Tamiya Peninsula. While another bird has surprisingly decided to take a western route by crossing Himalayas directly and reach to the breeding ground at Yenisi Gulf in Russia, which is on the west side of the Timia Peninsula. So this route was very new to science for birds from Singapore. And for common resident has mostly tagged or tagged from Sungai Bulu. They were found all breed in the Beijing High Plateau. Well, some of the birds has used the western route through Myanmar, crossing directly through Himalayas to reach to breeding ground. While others have taken a eastern route by using in the Gulf of Thailand area and through the edge of the Tibet Plateau, reach to Tibet Qinghai Plateau, the breeding ground. Without directly cross Himalayan during the northward migration. However, the birds that crossed the Himalayan during northward migration and some of the birds did not have used the direct crossing back through Himalaya as well. So it's very interesting that we found out that Shaubur in Southeast Asia can actually cross Himalayan from their winter ground to breeding ground. Although birds like Batiud Godwit could do so, but this is the first time that Shaubur has confirmed to be able to do it as well. And also our funding surprisingly found out not only the bird use East Asian Australian flyway, but they also use the Central Asian flyway, which weren't so documented earlier. So basically Singapore is in the intersection of both flyway. Therefore, protect our wetland, including coastal wetland, mangroves, freshwater marsh. It's very important for migratory shorebirds in both of the flyway. We have published a paper on this, so my colleague can share the link so you could find out more about them. And these findings have surprised many people through media of TV and uh, newspapers. And MPAC was able to contribute to a good science on shower migration globally. So other than this uh, shower tracked by cell attacks, the traditional measure of burying flagging were able to contribute to the understanding of the migration route as well. And you will be surprised to know quite a few of the birds has been flagged in Czech Java, actually already been reported in other countries. For example, a juvenile body godwit flagged in Czech Java island were actually found in the North Sumatra in Indonesia in both season in February 2018 and December 2018. 
and a tiny bird at a red neck stint, which too small for any tracking device, was quite very productive. And as one bird was recorded in Shanghai, China, last year in July 2020. And another red neck stint flagged in Czech Java Island was recorded in South Japan in May 2021, just a few months back. So this actually is the first time a Singapore bird found in Japan. And that has made a Japanese researcher very excited and is something very new. Other than bird flagged in Czech Java being recorded in other countries, shower flag in other countries has also been reported in Plaubin. You can see on the left is a small rain extinct with an orange flag. And it was actually rained in Northwest Australia, was found by Czech Java Island in January 2019. And just recently, a bird flagged in Thailand in the inner Gulf has been reported in Czech Java Island as well. So we thank the good work of the researchers in Plaubin that include our staff and the volunteers. So there's this shower flagging color flagging protocol in the East Asian Australian flyway. And the different color of flags has been used by the birds. So you have learned that green over white is from Singapore, orange single flag is from Northwest Australia. And then there's other birds like, you know, black over green from Thailand and so on. You can check the station or Trillism Flyway Partnership website to find out more of this. So as a public, you can help us. You can help the shopper. And what you can do is join as one of our volunteers in our citizen science program. And you can help to monitor the shopper by taking a photo or write down your notes and report your findings. through one of this Facebook we have set up called Singapore Engraved Flight Sightings by sharing of your result. And we will be able to compile the information and eventually understand more of the bird movement. Thank you very much for listening to the talk. And I would like to make some acknowledgement for our colleagues at both Songhai Blue and Plau Ubin who work together on some of the research and monitoring activity and people who have contributed photo, photos, illustrations to this slide. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope this uh, slide, uh, this talk is of interest to you. And feel free to ask questions. We would like to, happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Now we have come to our Q&A session. Okay. Okay, we have our very first question uh, for David. So David, what is the significance of tracking the migratory routes of these birds? Is there any vital information that we are getting from this data? Yeah, of course. The reason uh, to understand uh, the migration route of this migratory shorebird is very important. So you know where the birds stop and where the birds actually breed. So basically, if only Singapore were to conserve the bird and 
which was not effective enough because migratory shower travel in distance and stop in different states. So by knowing of this place, we could actually work effectively with people together, such as through the platform of East Asian or Tradition Flyway Partnership, which Singapore is an active member, and also the ASEAN Flyway Network uh, project, which is led by a work together with the ASEAN member states. So we can work together with other countries together to protect some of this habitat and wetland to ensure the conservation of migratory bird. Yeah. Uh, so it's to enhance global partnership between uh, different countries as well as organizations to help with conservation of shorebirds. Yeah, yeah. I see, I see. Okay. Um, another question that uh, is related to this is, How do this choose which route to fly? How do the bird choose to the route to fly? It's a very mm -hmm. interesting question. Uh, actually, from the study, we have found out it could be uh, the determination by the breeding ground because the bird are breeding in the West. If they were to migrate across Himalaya, they will be flying a shorter distance so it's quite amazing that bird actually took in this harsh journey, fly as high as five to 6,000 meters above sea level and no place to stop. But they could actually take advantage of shorter migratory distance. Yeah. And a bird that breeds in the eastward would like to take a eastward migration route. There's some of the findings from uh, and Mark's study has uh, um, yeah, found out. Oh, I see there's a lot of factors for them to think about when they choose the route. Okay. Uh, okay. One more question. Okay. Heard that the coastal boardwalk at Chick Jawa is partially closed. Where is a good spot to see shorebirds at Chick Jawa? Do you have any recommendations? <laughs> okay, for if the boardwalk is closed, then yeah, that one, that one probably uh everyone has to wait for the boardwalk to open again. So yeah. the first section, half of it will be closed for until the end of this month. The other half will be um starting from end of this month to end of uh, October, yeah. So if the ball work were no, not fully closed uh, at the same time, then probably mm. people can try to use the part which are not closed. So of course, yeah. this will be a management issue um, that how the construction or uh, renovation work by better link to this uh, <laughs> public uh, uh, requirement. So along uh, the co coastal ball work, is there any, uh, your is there, do you have a favorite spot that you know that you can always see the rare stuff in that direction? Or there isn't such a spot, it's all along the, the boardwalk? It is quite dependent on, um, as I said, watching shower always need some equipment by using only, uh, you know, eyes, of course, cannot see far. So therefore, uh, it's good to have some equipment. So for example, if you have a scope, even a distance of far, you will be, still be able to see some of these short birds in good, great details. But of course, you can see some other larger birds, great bill heron, Chinese egret, little egret, or other species. Yeah. I see. I see. I see. Hmm. Yeah, I see a question here saying, uh, how do we better ensure migratory shower continue to stop over in Songhai Bulu and Chek Jawa by some uh, people? Okay. So this is a very good question as well, uh, because uh, um, MPAX has made a great effort trying to maintain the habitat of migratory shower in both Songhai Bulu and Chek Jawa. And in addition to Songhai Bulu, MPAX has uh, 
you know, um, working on this uh, Mandama flat, mangrove and nature park, uh, Mandai mangrove and mud flat nature park. So this was a, a very important site for bird feeding, same as the Czech Java. So and park are doing whatever best we can trying to promote uh, to protect the migratory shower in Singapore as uh, what we have now. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we, I actually have some last minute questions also. Uh, we'll take one more question uh -huh. and we'll see. Okay, another question is, how do birds track their location and return to the same spot each year? Yeah, like I have to say mm. uh, it's uh, instinct. So it's quite amazing how this happened. Of course, uh, there's a lot of theory on how, you know, uh, migratory bird navigate through the star, through the landscape, uh, through the inbuilt campus. So it's still ongoing study. But uh, we do understand that uh, this bird do have strong memory and to be able to identify the sites they have used before, which is safe and can ensure their success or migration. That's why they are coming back to Czech Java, to Sungai Bulu year after year. Yeah, and one of the sharing just now I made, a tiny Tarek sandpiper flagged in 2013 in Sungai Bulu, a single bird, was came back to the wetland every year. And that has uh, made a very interesting observation by the public every time when they see this bird. So because we have this wetland like Sungai Bolo, like Czech Java, and these birds are able to come back year after year. And we hope this wetland to be continue provide this uh, you know, critical stopover wintering site for them year after year for many years to come. Yeah, it's true. Good feeding spots like Sungai, Sungai Bulo will help to refill their, their energy before they move on the, to the next section of their journey. Okay. Um, I think we may not have time for more questions. Uh, okay. Maybe I'll take one last question. Uh, okay. Compare the weight of tracking device and the weight of the weight of weight. Uh, yeah, just compare it. Okay, comparing the weight of tracking device and the weight of the bird. Is it very heavy for the bird? We understand publics are always uh, quite concerned of a uh, bird welfare, and it's critical to us as well. We as scientists, conservationists, and bird lovers ourselves uh, take this very seriously. And there has been studies to understand how heavy a bird can take the tracking device. So the science study has shown the bird actually can take 3% of body weight as a, a guideline. If the bird are taking more than 3, 5%, a lot more, 5% or 10%, that will causing problem to the bird, either fail in migration or other issues of breeding. But within 3% of body weight, birds are generally very safe. It's like we wear a watch or handphone or carry some iPad. So basically we can do that, uh, carry a bag all day long. So basically 3% is the guideline we apply. That means if a windbrow is of 400 grams, yeah, so it could took a quite heavy device as a 3% of body weight, yeah. So basically that's the guideline we use for the bird, right? So it's very important that we take this in consideration so that bird welfare is always in consideration. Yeah, so our embark staff has been all trained carefully to be understand this need and try to take care of the bird as much as possible, do our best to ensure the bird safety during all our 
research activity. Thank you for this question. Okay. We really take it seriously. Yeah. Thank you, David, for such an informative and exciting uh, yeah. session. So uh, now that all of you know that know about the shorebirds that are found in Ubin, it's time to grab your binos and your camera and head down to Ubin for some shorebird watching after the, the, the uh, coastal boardwalk is up. So, however, if for some reason you are still interested to go, uh, as in to view these places, do check out our virtual tours. They could be found in the U Ubin Day 2020 playlist in our YouTube channel, MPAX SG. There's a tour that brings you to Chek Jawa wetlands, which is one of the good spots that for watching shorebirds. So for the time being, if anyone's interested, do check out this virtual tour. There is also another virtual tour to Katam Mountain Bike Park, our species recovery project for birds on Ubin. Up next, we have a talk on habitat enhancement at Perkan Quarry. Noel Thomas, the next speaker, will enthrall us with details about the floating wetland installed there. If you are interested to find out more, do join us at 4 p.m. later on. If you haven't signed up for the talk, you may still join us at the link shared on the chat. Or you may watch us on our YouTube channel, SG, either live or at a later date. This brings us to the end of this session. Thank you, David, once again for sharing with us about shorebirds. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed the session. For Zoom audience, may we invite all of you to stay a little longer for a group photo. And for our YouTube audience, we'll say goodbye to you first. Do share your feedback at the URL uh, at, in the description below. And we'll see you for the next live stream. Thank you.